Um, what I would really like to, to talk to you and with you about is how designers can and must become ac active catalysts for, for social change. Lots of buzzwords. We'll try and unpack what they, what they really mean. But what I really want to tell you is that we're not, we are not just having the possibility to become catalysts for social change. We are asked to become. We have the mandate almost, or we have a window of opportunity to become. So this sense of urgency, this sense of um, compelling, uh, of a compelling story, the title actually doesn't describe it enough. So let me change the title. It's the first thing that I try to do. Let's change the, the game a little bit. So what I'm really going to talk to you about is how designers will never be catalysts of social change. Unless. I owe you a, a finishing this phrase. So by the end of this talk, hopefully, we'll be able to, to finish this one. Um, think about what will that mean for, for you to complete this phrase. What, what really make, will make a difference for you to become a person who attracts and enables and makes things possible so that the projects you make, the things you, you help design, not, ho not only have happy users, not only have something that is more useful, more usable, more engaging, but actually make this incredibly complex life that our users, our communities, our people live go in a direction that we feel is a better direction for the society at large. And this is broadly what I will say is social change. Um, the examples that I I'm going to tell you about are taken from the work that I have done in the past seven or eight years. First, I was working at the Web Foundation, um, which is a foundation. It's a, it's a non-profit organization. That had, and my role was to create training centers and innovation labs in Africa to help create social enterprises. So working with people who consider entrepreneurship as a way, as a form of activism, to change the way their society acts, their community um, behaves. I took a few years um, in a more commercial environment, digging deeper into the education sector at EF Education First. And in the past six, past six months, I moved to Frog, which is, for those of you who don't know, I hope just two or three of you who don't know what Frog Design is, is a global design and strategy firm. So as a design studio, I think it's quite interesting the story and the evolution of Frog Design not only for the studio itself, but for the design community as a whole. I've seen that pretty much they, they overlap. So design, um, Frog Design started as an industrial design company, in, founded in 69 by Harmut Hesslinger, uh, uh, so on and so forth. But really in the 70s and 80s, what Frog Design was doing was create new products and create design languages that were running, that were helping running companies like Apple and Sony and Yamaha as, um, as successful businesses out of that. And in the 90s and, and in the past 10 years, really moving away from or complementing the, the industrial design excellence with digital design. So like any studio that you can think of, we started talking about digital and physical working together to create an experience, to create a service. Now, the interesting bit is that companies like Frog, companies like IDEO or other studios have, been, have found themselves in the past five years, I will say, working on a completely new set of challenges, on a completely new set of projects, projects that are social at core, and not social in the sense of um, not only social in the sense of social connectivity, but social in the sense of society. So you could say that our societal um, 
projects, except nobody calls them societal, everybody calls them social anyway. So projects that we have we been running and working with, with UNICEF or with the um, um, GSMA Association, really try and tackle how people can improve their lives uh, through the creation of products and services. And this is something that I find particularly interesting because I've seen the design community and the, the, and the design companies are moving in that direction as well. Take it as a, almost like as an indication of what is going to happen to the majority of the design firms and studios in the next few years. So I'm going to take some lessons from the work that I've done at the Web Foundation and, and at Frog and the work that I have seen hands-on uh, when I was working and when I'm working there. My geographical exposure to a certain extent is mostly focused on Africa, West Africa and, and East Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and to a minor degree to Asia, Cambodia, China and other countries there. So I don't think I'll, I know everything about the, the intersection between design, technology, and social change, but I've seen in the past seven years enough to create some patterns to see what are the data points that help us imagine what could happen in the, next, uh, in the near future. And I'm going to talk about those points. I'm going to talk about what are the challenges that we face and what are some of the solutions to these challenges that I've seen. Now, if you consider the geographical exposure, if you consider this as a starting point, as a context that we have to move in, it's obviously quite different from what you can expect in Europe or in the United States. It's very opposite, if I can say, um, from uh, the, the context that Kendra was talking about this morning. So it's not about granola, it's a bit more about millet. Um, and so this context talks, uh, in this context you'll have the majority of population that are employed in agriculture. You'll have the majority of population who are farmers, small, uh, smallholder farmers, uh, in most of the cases. And they are organizing their lives not, about, not around nuclear families, but around larger communities. They are the, their center, their epicenter of, of gravity is a small community in, in a non-dense uh, area. So in not, a, not a urban area, but mostly a countryside, um, traditional community. And so when technology enters those spaces, when technology enters this context, it enters in a slightly different way. Um, the first example, the best example that I have is actually radios are becoming a way for small communities to organize themselves around. There are community radio stations that actually cover just a few kilometers. And those are the ways for the social fabric to reinforce itself. There are the DJs that talk about what is important for the community. There are the, the farmers who listen to that and contribute actively to the discussion with the radio itself. It's, it's a way to create a bonded um, community in that sense. And when mobile phones enter that space, they enter significantly, so 60, between 67 and 70% of the population in different countries in, in Africa, for example, have a mobile phone and use it actively. However, for people like Yakuba, uh, who is here, who is a farmer in, uh, at the border between uh, Mali and Burkina Faso, for people like Yakuba who don't know how to read and write, the mobile phone has a completely different meaning, has a completely different set of behaviors that are enabled by. Um, definitely different from what you can expect your typical smartphone using persona that you think about when you design a new application or a new service. And in this context, infrastructures are minimal, reduced. There's not enough 
roads, um, electricity, there's not enough of the basic infrastructures that you need, um, usually, that you consider it as a burden, and it is, but it also means that every type of technology that enters in the space, like portable printers, um, needs to adapt to a very non-infrastructure-based and mobile life. In this case, um, we stumbled upon, when I, we were doing some research, we stumbled upon a photographer who had no intention to create a photography studio, but to actually have a motorcycle and a portable printer and create his, his own pop-up studio when and where people were needing him. So technology really enables and, and suffers from the, the existing conditions that are present. And it's a technology that it, it's minimal, I will say. You could call it very minimalistic design. Um, I'm not sure if, if it will count in that direction. But it, it has to be hackable. It has to be fixable in a sense that it becomes eternal and multi-purpose. It, it's working. That, that, that um, oil pump was actually working. Um, not sure about the safety regulations around that, but hey. Um, but that also means that people have the possibility to make technology eternally changing. This, this is a, another um, example from Morovia, from uh, Liberia. And this guy and a bunch of other guys were in a small confined space and were all hacking mobile phones. They were all building modular mobile phones out of repaired and other scrap parts. So, at the forefront of technology, you have companies like Google and LG who are trying to create modular mobile phones. And here you have a guy who, are, who is actually making modular mobile phones and, and constantly changing them at the requirement of his customers, I, which I find particularly interesting. And if a technology is successful, is a technology that has to adapt and take advantage almost of the challenges and the, and the troubles that the society and the, and the users have. The, the example, the best example, it's, it's a bit old, um, that I have in mind is uh, of a company called M-Pesa. Now, how many of you are familiar with, the with m -Pesa? Okay. S Sorry, I cannot see, there are too many lights, but I've seen few, few raised hands, not the majority. So I'll tell you what it is. M-Pesa is essentially probably the first successful mobile transaction and money company in the world. Um, it, was, it started more than 10 years ago, and it, got, it released their first product six, seven years ago. And it allows people to essentially keep their money in an e-wallet. Very, very simple. The way they do it is by going to an agent and giving, and giving money there and saving it to their mobile phone, to a, to a special pay space in the SIM card. And it's successful for many reasons, but the, the trigger point is that 80% of the population in Kenya don't have a bank account and are not welcome to open a bank account because the transaction costs are way too difficult. The way the banks have structured their products makes it uninviting for the banks and for the consumers to actually have and open a bank account. So there is a space for a new technological product, for a new technical innovations to, to enter. And it only works if there is a, a network of agents, so a, a social element there that allows and enables trust. And it's a context where a, a majority, or in, depending on which country, um, or a large part of the population lives under two dollars with under two dollars per day which means that you don't have enough bandwidth to save anything, pretty much, or to, to, to save some money 
for long time, for long time enough to buy things in bulk. So most of the purchases or the purchasing behaviors are towards small doses. Small doses of petrol in an absolute vodka bottle, which is, I found particularly awesome, actually. Small doses of cigarettes, small doses of millet and, and rice, small doses of peanuts, small doses of everything, which as a consequence means that you cannot save money or have economies of scale. And that makes poverty a rather expensive situation to be in, paradoxically. And this paradox are, con are not only about the economic situations, are about the lack of um, infrastructures, as I mentioned, the lack of education or the lack of sanitation, or, and so on and so forth. And they all interconnect together in a way that creates interdependencies and that makes the problems that we have to solve as designers or as architects or as engineers pretty difficult. Um, there is a technical term, which is wicked problems. It has lots of connotation, if I say wicked problems, because it has a 10-point checklist of what it means. But it's pretty much a rather complex and difficult problem to solve. So as designers, we have succeeded, or we are succeeding in, in helping companies achieve their business target. We have succeeded in creating um, services, public services, private services. And now, companies like Frog, companies like IDEO, small studios, large organizations inside, in-house, are asked to say, can you help us solve some of those problems? So how do we, do we enter into these pictures as a design community? Um, my assumption, my hypothesis here is that we can enter saying that by improving the, the human experience of these people um, through services, new or better services, new solution or better solutions, uh, the, the ones that are here, we can mitigate if we cannot solve some of these complex issues. And we have to do it the same, the same way we always do it, through limited resources and by using behaviors, the, the behaviors of, of people we work with and we work for as a core engine of the change that we want to make. Now, that there is one complex element. There is one element of complexity, and I think this quote from, from Mariana Matullo of Design Matters summarizes it quite neatly which is reality is, is messy and unpredictable. And, and that sometimes conflicts with the desire as designer, or probably as an OCD person, you, you, can, you can decide which of the two, um, to have everything under control, to design this end-to-end -end experience that fantastically will change everything. So we have to learn um, to, to love ambiguity and to really see that there are no linear paths that, uh, that will lead to change. And let go this illusion of, of complete control that we sometimes have at the beginning of a project or when we start mapping our um, service blueprint or when we start using uh, scenarios to describe how perfect um, the solution will be. Now, this dilemma, control versus, versus ambiguity, I think brings three challenges, and those are the challenges that I want to dis discuss a bit more in detail today. Luckily, with some challenges, there are also some solutions there, so we'll, we'll see some of the solutions. The first challenge is about including people, how we de design with people, how we design with the communities that we want to help and, and have an impact on, how do we design with stakeholders, organizations um, like UNICEF in the case um, of FROG or other organizations that we have been asked to work with and for. The second challenge is about how do we avoid getting lost in the complexity of those problems. 
there is such a thing as analysis paralysis, and there is a thing, there is a paralysis in getting lost in, in this uh, incredible amount of complexity. We'll see how we can try and, and solve that. The third challenge is about how do we really add value and not just execute the task? Because this is one of the points that will make us as designers more or less ready to keep working on these type of challenges. If we keep executing tasks or activities, it will not be enough value. It will not have um, enough strength to keep working on, on those. So let's start the, with the first challenge, the, the challenge about people. How do we include those people? And I think the starting point is the fact that the scale and the interconnection and, and the depth of those problems mean that we are no longer, and probably we have never been, but this is super visible, we cannot go alone. Autonomy is, is a no-go uh, at all. So we don't have enough capabilities, enough knowledge, enough resources, and probably sometimes not enough social sensibility to be the design superheroes that we really would like to be. We, uh, we have to therefore change our perception of ourselves first before you start and, and move from being the, the superhero to being the, the super designer to become a facilitator mostly, to take the, the the variety of people we will work with and create and make them designers and make sure that they will become part of the solution actively, not just part of the investigation, not just part of the research, not just part of the stakeholders interviews that we have at the beginning of a project. Now we have some ways and we have as designers in, in many projects that I think you have done, we have already solved some of those problems. Mostly it's about taking a, a humble approach to say, there are many things I don't know. And the best way to, to be humble is to start building empathy with the different people um, that are involved in the, in the projects. Now, tools as designer in, in your toolkit, if you look at your design toolkit that you probably have in the pockets here and there, what's the best tool for empathy? To create empathy? Any, anybody? Please. OK. I will go for immersive participatory research first. And, and I think it's something that has um, of all the examples of all the projects that I've seen, it's the one that is always used, and, and successfully so. Um, because that's, that's the first way to really immerse yourself into not only the context, not only um, the country, the place where they are, but in a small community. So you start understanding what are the relationship between people. You start understanding what are the challenges in situ, where they, where they are. Now, and it's even better if you start using props and visual supports to help you tease out some more information, to help you, uh, to help the people participating tell a better story about what happened, about what are the challenges that they have. Sometimes the challenges or the problems that you want them to talk about are way too abstract to be talked about. So they have to visualize it, they have to tell a story. And uh, they are way too distant from you to understand them really, unless they are in a form of a story. So. A participatory design with lots of things to play with is the basic tool that you'll have to use in those circumstances. And I say that it's participatory and it's immersive. And when I say immersive, 
I, I really mean immersive. I mean going with spending time, spending weeks and, uh, and probably months with the people who are you you're end up working and designing with uh, and for. In my first project um, in, in Burkina Faso, I made a little mistake. I decided to fly in, fly out, uh, live in a hotel, actually a relatively nice hotel uh, comp for the country, um, take a private driver, um, eat in fancy restaurants, and I discovered that I knew nothing of what was the real life. I, I, I was spending time doing participatory research and all the, um, the fancy methods and tools that I had learned about, but there wasn't enough informal empathy. I was living in a bubble uh, of this 0.1% of the population that really has an extremely good life. So scrap that. Um, take, rent a place. Uh, open a pop-up studio around the corner in, in a normal street where, where people live. Um, take trains and buses and matatus and anything that people usually commute with. Um, take pictures. This is not my picture. This is a picture from uh, the Yen Chip Chase um, team that worked at Frog a few years ago. But really, that's the, the spirit to go for. Negative side, you'll probably have the, some, some problems and some cramps at the stomach if you start eating um, at restaurants that don't take um, hygiene at the highest standard. Positive side, the project will be much better. The, the, your understanding of the project, your understanding of the challenges will, will benefit a lot. So cramps for good, in a, in a sense. And Doing that, uh, really living and, and immersing yourself in the context has a good consequence, which is makes you understand the social structure, the social fabric. How do people communicate? How do people avoid conflicts? How do people um, try and organize themselves? How do they divide labor and so on and so forth? What are the unwritten rules of organization? And this is something that, as designers, we, we don't consider enough when we do a design project. And especially if the context is completely different from what you, can, um, what you are familiar with, it's, it's mandatory. Otherwise, it will fail. It will not succeed. The other way to, to solve this initial challenge, this first challenge of involving people, is really to consider not only how you can immerse yourself, but how can you really create and activate a community of people, or find a community of people who are active already to tackle a problem like could be um, access to um, financial information or access to marketplaces. So this is a, a set of solutions around activating the, the communities, which are a key part of every project of design for, for, so, for social change. The, the first one is to really inspire and find what I will call local change makers, people who have try to solve that problem or have struggled um, through that, the, the same problem. People who, if you talk about the problem, you'll find them because many different conversations will end up with referring the same person. You'll, you'll see that the, the, the way we, we usually find those local change makers is because they are the most active or the most annoyed by something. They are the ones that feel the pressure or, the, um, or have tried something in the past. And bring them on board. Start bringing them as 
local guides, start bringing them as people who are constantly following the project as much as, as they can. They will become the ones that will continue the, the work as you disappear, as you start, as you um, go and move to different projects, or as you don't have enough resources anymore to, to continue working on that project. And the other aspect is that you have to help them remove all the, the barriers that they have in helping them solve problems. One of the barriers that we, that we found that we have been told many, many times is that they don't know what to do. They don't know how to organize things in a way that will move from understanding and, and, sol and discussing about the problem to try and solve them. So, few companies, um, Frog is one, IDEO has done other um, similar examples, have started building this idea of methods and toolkits for um, people in the community to become more active participants into that. Frog has the collective action toolkit, which you can download for free. Um, so go on the website, sorry, end of the promotion. But, um, but really what, it, what is interesting is not the fact that we have a free toolkit that you can download on the website, um, but it's the fact that it exists. It's the fact that this has been proven successful uh, to help the local ch change makers. And what they really needed is very small things um, to a certain extent. They need to understand what are the areas where they can make a difference what are the um, things that they can do to start, for example, interviewing or to start understanding a bit more about the project, um, to start mapping it out, to start um, collecting information, and then to start brainstorming about possible solutions. So it's really about minimizing the confusion and, and the complexity that they have when they want to move from problem to solution and be there as a designer and as a facilitator, as I was saying, to support them and to help them in that journey. Which brings us to the second challenge. The second challenge is how to avoid getting lost in this, in this complexity. And I will say that one of the major contributors to this complexity, beside the fact that there are incredibly complex problems and, and difficult and interconnected one each with each other, but on top of that, the use of jargon, the use of abstraction, the use of mm, definitions that can be interpreted by different people and different, uh, different communities in different ways, that adds barrier, that removes the facility to actions. Obviously, nonprofit organization and NGO have their own lingo made of um, capacity building, made of field trips and inclusive capabilities and so on and so forth. Um, and designers, hey, um, we have our own, we are responsible as well. We, we have our progressive disclosure, we have our call to action, we have our awareness, we have so on and so forth. Um, and sometimes they don't talk to each other. What does it mean, development? Uh, that, that was the best example that I thought. We had a conversation with a person working in an NGO for five minutes, and I was talking about development as a software development, and she was talking about development as a social development. So as you start making, using different languages, different vocabularies, you have to consider how to translate that. Or you have to start making that the, the things that you want to say tangible. So using prototypes, paper prototypes, this is the easiest way to translate complex and, and difficult conversations into something that doesn't mean it in that way. And that starts helping reducing the barrier to entering the conversation to people who will be in the community there. Now a bit more complex, um, is when you start adding technologies to the conversation. That means that you start bringing 
platforms that work, and you start asking people to use them. Um, there's a method that you can investigate. It's called technology probes. You essentially bring a functioning platform, and you ask a small group of people to start using them uh, with three goals. One is an engineering goal. You want to test in the field if the technology will work. The second one is, is a ethnographic and, uh, goal. You want to understand how people will react, how will they change their behavior. And, and third, there is a design goal. You want to have some time, some weeks, um, to see how people respond to that technology and see what new ideas, new possibilities you could build on top, or they could build on top. So um, this is an example that, conscious of time, I will probably skip. Um, ask me over a drink uh, about the fantastic example of Radio Marche and as a technology probe. But as you start bringing more complex issues, sometimes a prototype or a technology probe is not enough. And luckily, when you start talking about more complex systems, you can show the invisible forces that run um, behind them. The first, ex the first way is kill every meeting that you will ever have. Just don't have meetings. How do you communicate? You start bringing workshops. You start having things that, in order to communicate, have to be tangible. You'll start asking people to use paper and, and pencils to describe things in a way that is visible for everyone. And over time, that means that you start creating a visible mental model of what it means uh, for the different actors to, uh, or the different people involved to engage with the project you have. Start building information flows that actually give you a, a dynamic picture of what happens at the different stages. Or you start using your customer journey maps um, that really help you understand where are the different problems at, at the moment. There are a variety of other methods to, to really make sure you remove um, the complexity. But I think um, I will rather stay on this uh, for today. And so I can talk about the third challenge that we have, which is quite massive, I would say. It's, it's about how do we move away from just delivering things that we have been asked to, or we have tried to challenge, but just focus on our output as designers, and start moving to the idea of outcomes. Now, as we organize projects, sometimes this is quite difficult. As we organize projects, we are asked for outputs. We are not asked to respond to um, something that will probably impact uh, people's life. So really, the translation between what is that we do and what will be the benefit of um, for the users in the long term, for the communities in the long term, is, is challenging. It's what makes the difference, um, what will make the difference for us as a design community. Few examples that I've seen have tackled it in, in a positive way. Uh, one is, is from Frog, and it's this idea of moving away from projects and is getting into longitudinal engagements. When I, when I say longitudinal, I mean both in, var in different locations at the same time and for a much longer term than your usual project will be like. So one example, one project that we are running um, at Frog with GSMA, which is the Group Spe Special Mobile Association, is the, the organizers of the World Mobile Congress in Barcelona, and they are the convener of different telecom organizations, is the creation of products and services that help improve the life of small order farmers. It's a project or it's an engagement that runs across six different countries, and it's ongoing 
it's more than two years that is, that is running, and we are co currently involved in, in that. The way we are involved is because we can bring the service design and human-centered design skills um, to the partnership, to, to the engagement, while telecom organizations and other organizations like Oxfam can um, help and bring the local understanding and can help and bring the understanding of what are the unmet needs of, of the farmers there. Um, and it started as a starting point with the idea that there are 500 million underserved smallholder farmers that have no access to critical information and financial services in the markets. So what we really have done, we have helped working throughout the project from the insights to the pilot. Uh, but what has really made, made the difference here is working, changing the way we, we organize the project. On one side, not being fully involved all the time, but really have a dedicated session at the beginning where what we create is we help structure the project, we help do the research, we help concepting on the, pro on the different uh, products, and we help attract the um, change makers, the local change makers. We, and along the way, what we do is we, we varied, we changed, we fine-tune our involvement depending on what are the results that their different products are making. Where are the challenges that they are facing? So in that case, we have a variety of remote and, and on-the-ground advisory. We have a intense sessions of coaching uh, to the local change makers and few moments where we are hands-on, where we see that there is a specific problem that is impacting negatively on the uh, success of, um, of the farmers. And so we help and do mini projects around those or mini sprints around that. And together with GSMA, we have found that Again, as I, I was saying before, the presence of toolkits, in this case, the presence of a toolkit dedicated to um, the, the pr creation of agricultural products and services, really makes a difference to uh, bring more people uh, and more local change makers there. Now, I, I see a zero, 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 zero. Do I have time for one more example, or do you want to? Yes, you do. Cool. So, the other part that really challenges the ability or the, the intent of us as designers, or at least my ability, let's, let's not be pretentious, uh, let's focus on what I felt, is that in order to add value in this lim with these limited resources, and I had to th rethink the way I work or the way the te my team works as designers and really design the minimum possible intervention that, that creates a difference, that makes a difference, to really just work on the missing component of the puzzle. There, are, there could be a few examples there, but I think the, the, best examples that I've the, the best example I've seen actually comes from a company, from a startup that we were incubating when I was at the Web Foundation. It's called Enisa, Edu Enisa Education. And what they are, they are an SMS service that act as a vir virtual tutor and a teacher assistant in, in Kenya. So for people between 10 and 18 year old, um, they can use the service in the classroom or outside of the classroom, first to have some quizzes or, or question and answers to really validate if they have understood their current lesson, and they can start having um, feedback from their teachers. So when they are away from the class, when they are away from um, the moment where the, 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 the conversation with the teacher will be easier, they can keep the conversation going. And the conversation is facilitated, is triggered first by a series of automated questions and answers. So that removes a little bit of the 
shyness that some of those uh, students have when facing an authority, when facing a teacher. And the success is demonstrated that they have, I think, 800,000 800, users and 100, more than 100,000 active users, which means they use it more than 20 times per month, which is quite a good definition of having active users. Now, the case of Enisa is not interesting just because of the, the product that they are doing, but it's interesting because the product in itself feels small and contained, feels that it's fitting into the environment, in, into the context. And that's m where most of their work has been. Uh, on one side, in really understanding what were the what was this social fabric, what were the troubles between teachers and students and, and student and student. And on the other side, and so in creating triggers for that. And on the other side, they have created um, adaptive um, systems. So they can create or they can propose questions and quizzes to the students that are relevant, that are just at the level of difficulty, that are just at the moment when they will need it. And all this crazily complex work makes the product feel smaller and, and more contained, makes the product fit much better into the context um, where, where it goes. Disruptive, I don't know if you can call it disruptive innovation, but I will say that it's, it's, it's a product that has maximum outcome and all the outcome evaluations, all the impact evaluation are actually super positive in that sense with a minimum possible intervention. So it's a sort of minimum viable product for social change, if you want. And this is essentially all that I wanted to share with you today. Except I still owe you the continuation of this sentence here. I still owe you how do we finish this sentence. And there are two answers to that um, that I think we have talked through um, during this talk. The first one is that designers will never be catalysts of social change unless we as designers consider these challenges. The first is that we have to consider how to include people in the design effort, stakeholders and communities. We have to consider how to reduce the complexity and make it visible, and we have to consider how can we add value to the conversation and not just ship products. And the second answer is some of the tools, some of the solutions to these challenges. So as designers, we'll never be catalysts of social change unless we start using open research methods, um, participatory design, immersive design, ways to contribute, to have more people uh, to contribute, unless we design a way, a method, a pathway to activate the communities that will take over and that will replace us when we go on a different project. Unless we prototype our way to meaningful solutions, um, whether it's paper prototype or technology probes uh, or other ways, um, it's a, probably one of the best ways for you as a designer to contribute and and become a catalyst of social change. Unless we mentor, we review, we follow, we adapt our programs to really be fitting where are the most difficult problems. Whether they are product problems or community-related problems, we have to ver change the way and under change our understanding of our role. And unless we create minimum interventions that maximize outcome and they try and maximize the impact that we make. And with that, I thank you and I, will want, I hope that you have questions over drinks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, 
Can you tell us whether you have somehow managed to leverage the learnings from the brutally lean economy of small doses uh, to developing products or services in more mature markets? Damn good question. Um, no, the answer is, is no, I haven't. Uh, if I understand your, your question correctly, what you're asking is, okay, there is this small doses economy that is running and how can we use this to in more mature markets? Yes, in the context of people recognizing that the resources are scarce and that uh, the world is not limitless, etc. And, and no, I, I haven't. It's actually a question that I will ask all of you. So I think it's an incredibly powerful question to, to ask ourselves is how can we start considering this as a design challenge for, for ourselves? Uh, so if anybody has any answer to the, this question, the drink and the, and the after party, I think, will be the best moment or conversations tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Mm, oh, thank you, Wojtek. So this, uh, I, I believe I saw someone there. Okay, I got you. I spotted you there, and <laughs> you, will, you will have uh, the mic in five, four, four three, three, two, two one. one. Ignition. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for this presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, though I have a bit difficult question, because Frog is a um, commercial agency. So I would like to know why Frog is moving into that direction a little bit. Why mm -hmm. do you choose to do that? You and got too who much is money? Hmm? Too much money? No, yeah, no. too much money. And no. then the following question is exactly about money, because do you think you will be able to generate profit with these people because they're a huge uh, market that is not being being served mm -hmm. and from getting little payments from there you can actually pay for these projects this is one way so going the commercial way and the second one or do you plan to use uh, money from charities or governments or UK aid so for me this is interesting how do you plan to do it co uh, commercially <coughs> in the long term so this is the question that we ask ourselves um, as, as frog is how, well, two questions, why and how, essentially. Why, I think, because it's one of the most challenging fields to work in, and at the same time, it's probably one of the most rewarding, personally, for the group of designers um, that we work with, and it's one that has a, an effect also in other type of projects that we work in, sometimes, uh, learning from these projects has helped us to structure projects that are outcome driven, even in, in commercial organizations. As you start working with startups, for example, there are lots of problems that, although different, have some common patterns. Yeah. The how, um, and especially the how on money, is something that is that has one of those it depends answer. So let me unpack it a little bit. Most of the programs that we do in the social impact space actually are paid projects, are projects that we work with large organizations like GSMA or UNICEF, and they give us money to work on that. And that, ring, uh, that raises the, the question of, okay, what value do we add? Do we really add value to the, to the program? Is it, or is it something that would rather just give back the money and say, sorry, um, we'll just not be helpful enough for you? And that has happened a couple of times, with, to say, even before starting, obviously, to say, no, this is a project where we think we don't add, add enough value. It's a reflection for us to, and it's a challenge for us to say, where do we think we can bring um, the project and the initiative to a, to a different level. Now, going into different models, going into, for example, uh, models where you consider a commercial route is something that where, when I was at the Web Foundation, we were experimenting with. So the incubation labs and the innovation labs had 
um, some form of either equity exchange with the startups, the social enterprises, or had some form of uh, revenue share, or had different forms to really understand how to um, play together with the small, uh, the small players, the, the startups that were born out of the incubation and, and training labs. So it's not something that is common at, at Frog, but it's a, it's, a, it's a model that works, or at, at least it, it's not something that is common at Frog for the social impact program. It's common in other, in other programs to actually take away this idea of getting paid for hours, essentially, and moving towards getting paid for the results that we help. Does that answer your question? Hmm? Okay, we can continue the conversation. Exactly, over the drink yes. at 8.15. 8 yeah. um, any other questions? Maybe there's someone who'd like to ask the last question today because we should, we, oh yeah, great. We should wrap things up now. Um, so, uh, when you're undertaking these large research projects, you don't seem to have much of a goal, which you think is important. Uh, you're just there to observe and, and see what opportunities there are. Um, do you think that's essential, or maybe uh, how well would an organization with less resources be able to do that uh, in the, the places you were discussing in Africa? Valid question, and that makes me think that I haven't stressed enough that I think as we start the research, we actually have we, we go broader than the initial scope, but we really have key points that we want to, to take. We have assumptions that we have. We have um, defined briefs on what we want to understand, what we don't know, or what we know that we don't know. Now, then we discover that there are things we didn't know we didn't know, and, and that's where it starts becoming either too messy or very interesting and you start diverging and taking the research to a completely different path. Um, I think my recommendation for large research undertaking is start small, start with a defined brief that you want to, to have at the beginning, and then at the end of each day, reflect back on, okay, what else do we need to know? Where else are we ignorant? Where else w did we have assumptions that were part of our, uh, were in the back of our mind, were essentially part of our ideology that was unwritten, unspoken. And I think that that helps a lot. Every day, go and, and present and challenge your own research brief. And what I really has helped is again, this idea of tangible things that you bring to the research. The more you bring it, the more you'll discover, uh, use it as a prop, as a, as a stimulus, the more you'll discover that all the, the hypotheses you had will get challenged. Um, and you didn't even know this before. Yep. Great, thank you. You're welcome. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Franco.